Hey people, I'm Carlos Luna, content producer here at Roll20, and today I'm going to be walking you through the game Thirsty Sword Lesbians so you can start playing as quickly as possible. The first part of this video is geared towards players, but the GMs should watch the entire video. Thirsty Sword Lesbians is a game that focuses on relationships and the emotions they cause. Whether it's between characters or a PC and an NPC, TSL guides you in exploring your character's feelings and using them to advance the game. Cross swords or trade blaster fire, but most importantly, feel deeply, powerfully, and often. This game uses the Powered by the Apocalypse system and is played with normal D6s. Players choose from different broad archetypes to build their heroes and create strong relationships with each other. Now, the Game Master, or GM, creates the story and guides the players through dramatic situations and sometimes provokes those situations to cause a little drama. The GM has a very important role, but if you're new to this game or TTRPGs in general, don't worry. You and your players are all playing together to create this world and story. Now, before you begin creating characters, make sure that everyone at the table understands and agrees that they'll be sharing in a queer focused story and that there's no place for misogyny, transphobia, racism, or other forms of bigotry. Now, the Thirsty Sword Lesbian game module on Roll20 contains a palette page that everyone should contribute to. Give everyone the opportunity to write down the things that they're excited about seeing and not seeing in the game. Creating a palette of concepts that you want to include and concepts you don't want to include in your game is a very helpful way to make sure that everyone at the table is comfortable with the story you're about to be telling. Building a character. First, players choose a playbook to fill out. Each playbook is a combination of an archetype and a particular internal emotional conflict. For example, the beast follows their own passion, which puts them in conflict with civilized norms. These broad archetypes allow for tons of customizations. Think of them as an outline for their character. Keep in mind that there can only be one of each type of character at the table. No doubling up. Name and aesthetic. Each player chooses the character's name and pronouns, and then makes aesthetic choices based on the prompts in the playbook. Now, this includes their demeanor, their clothing style, and the distinctive look of their sword. Stats. Players then choose between two variations of their stats. These stats will be added to their die rolls when they make moves throughout the game. Special rules and playbook moves. Finally, each playbook will lay out any special rules for that character and what each character's unique moves are. Players will start with one move pre-selected and will choose additional moves during character creation. Introductions. After everyone is done filling out their playbook, Go around and introduce all the characters to one another by giving their names, pronouns, looks, and personality. Also, share a summary of their emotional conflict and playbook mechanics to help the other players understand what they're all about. Relationships. Now that introductions are done, it's time to establish the starting relationships and history among each other player. Each playbook has prompts to help you out, so don't worry about that. Players will propose a relationship to one another, and if both players agree, that relationship becomes part of the narrative. Now, the Roll20 module has a relationship worksheet page to help keep track of players' questions and defined relationships. Strings. Now that relationships are set, every player will give each other's character zero, one, or two strings on themselves. Strings represent a character's emotional influence over another person. This could be the affection of a friend or blackmail. Having a string on another character can allow a player to influence them by spending that string. I'm gonna go through an example of play with some mechanics worked in, and I'm also gonna leave a link in the description below of an actual play playing through the entire game. Okay, in our example, the players are trying to gain entry into a gala to save the Baron from an assassination plot. As they approach the front gate, a guard bars the entrance, saying that only those with an invitation may pass. Now, one of our players wants to try to flirt their way past. They describe the flirtation and quick wit, and the GM has them roll the move Entice. The player simply rolls 2d6 and adds their heart trait to that roll. Now, whatever the roll is will help determine what happens next. Rolls will land in the following ranges. 10 plus is considered an upbeat. This means that the player achieves what they set out to do without any serious complications. Seven to nine is a mixed beat. Usually means that the player succeeded, but there's a cost or complication. 
A six or less causes a downbeat though. This usually causes complications for the players. So our player rolls to entice and the total is a 10. Not only do they gain a string on the guard, but the guard grows flustered and in the ensuing awkwardness, the characters slip past them into the party. Now, safely inside the gala, they search among the party goers and quickly find the Baron. They decide to convince him that there's a plot against his life. One player has a string on the Baron from earlier in the game, having grown up as his childhood friend. She decides to make the move influence with a string to convince him his life is in danger. Now, because she's spending the string, no role is required. And since they're childhood friends, we can say that they believe the PCs and they follow them out of the party. Now, as the group is making their way towards the door, the assassin moves in from out of the crowd. One character sees them with their keen eye and moves to intercept. Now, the GM has them roll the fight move and their total is a seven, a mixed beat. The player decides that they use this moment to call out to the assassin, creating a role-playing moment where they make the assassin second guess their allegiance gaining a string on them. They also choose to inflict a condition on the assassin. Now, conditions are difficult emotional states that have both narrative and mechanical effects. When a character is inflicted with a condition, they first decide which condition they take based on the circumstance. Then they take a penalty on an associated move. Each condition will cause a different penalty. A character can be under the effects of multiple conditions at one time, but take note, if at any point a player would gain a six condition, they are defeated. NPCs deal with conditions a little bit differently though. Depending on how formidable they are, the GM decides how many conditions they can take before they're defeated. In our example, the GM decides the assassin gains the guilty condition. But because the player used the fight move and fighting always has repercussions, the GM decides to also inflict a condition on their character the player decides to take the insecure condition. Now, fortunately for the party, the assassin was not too formidable. The GM decides taking one condition is enough to be defeated and he drops his dagger in fear. The players were successful in saving the Baron and the day. Now that the danger has passed, one of the players tries to reassure the insecure character who stopped the assassin. They make the emotional support move and describe taking a walk with the other player comforting them after the intensity of the last scene. The player rolls 2d6 and adds their heart. They get a total of eight. The insecure player thanks them and calms down, clearing the insecure condition from their playbook. Okay, that's just a quick example of how a scene may play out in a game. Most of the game involves the GM setting up the scene and players describing what they do to make the corresponding moves when appropriate. Now keep in mind that players don't only have to do the moves in their playbook. They can try anything they'd like. The moves are more of a guide for when you're uncertain of what to do next. So the Roll20 character sheet has all the basic moves and the playbook moves on it for quick reference. Experience. At the end of a session and sometimes during the game, players will gain experience. There are a few ways they'll receive experience. If a move tells them to, if a player rolls and their total after adding their stats is six or less, at the end of the session. When a player gains experience, they can mark it in their playbook. They can spend five XP to take an advance from their playbook. Game Masters. Okay, so just like the players have their moves that are unique to their playbook, you have moves that are unique to being the GM. As the GM, you will never have to roll dice. Your moves happen no matter what. You will have to make GM moves in three types of situations though. Whenever a player rolls a total of six or less, causing a downbeat. Whenever the table gets quiet and players are trying to figure out what to do next, and whenever a formidable NPC suffers a condition. Your GM moves come in three types, narrative moves, mechanical moves, and playbook moves. The following moves are just some ideas of what you could do, but if you have a cool idea to expand story and complicate their lives, you should do that. Now, if you wanna make a narrative move, you might try something like making them face a temptation, offering what they want at a high cost, giving an ultimatum, showing that their new love interest also earns them a new enemy. As far as mechanical move goes, you might try take a string on them, inflict a condition, 
offer XP to have them make an unwise decision. Now, each playbook also has some specific GM moves associated with them. The Roll20 module has them listed as a GM quick reference sheet, so check that out. It helped me write this video. GM strings. Now, at the beginning of each session, the GM gets a number of generic strings equal to the number of players at the table. So, four players, four strings. They can influence an NPC by spending one of their generic strings at any time. Now, there are some things within this game that I didn't touch on for this video, like ways to spend string, final advances, and end of session XP, but those things don't hinder you running the game. Uh, if you wanna check those out, check out Thirsty Sword Lesbians on the Marketplace. The compendium has hyperlinks, so you can just click on stuff and it'll take you to those sections. It was really helpful when I was writing this. My main takeaway for this game, it's meant to be played differently for different tables, depending on what's most fun for you. So feel free to customize moves, rules, premises, whatever you want, as long as it fits your table and the tone of story that you're trying to tell. For examples of play, check the description below. I left a link in there for you. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up, subscribe. Let me know in the comments if you wanna see more videos like this. If you got a game that you're kinda interested in, but don't know if you wanna buy it right now and you want me to explain it to you, cool. Let me know in the description below. My name's Carlos Luna, and this has been Learn How, Play Now.